Welcome to the Selling in the Motor Trade podcast in association with Simcoe Training. This is the weekly podcast where we share best practice tips and ideas on how to sell more cars, improve your service department, and generally put more profit into your dealership or dealer group. I'm your host, Simon Bogert. Now, some of you probably already know me as Skippy. I want to start by saying thank you for taking the time to listen to this podcast. Hi, and welcome to another episode of Selling in the Motor Trade. Firstly, I want to say thank you so much to everyone out there who keeps on uh, subscribing to this. It's just going from strength to strength. We've got lots of tips and ideas on how to sell more cars and make more money. Uh, but I tell you what, lots of you guys are saying they really love the stories where we go and speak to people about how they've been successful in their business. So today it's a bit different. I'm joined by Gareth Timmons, and I'm really excited to get Gareth here. And we've we've tried to set this up for the last probably three or four months. And I read uh, Gareth's book. Um, he's he's going to tell you all about his book. But Gareth is actually a Royal Marines commando. And we're going to talk about his time in the forces and how what he's learned there can actually transfer into the business life. And, you know, I start off with the title for this podcast, and it's 99.9% of people need not apply. And that'll make more sense in a second because Gareth's company now is uh, 0.1%. And Gareth, you might want to start off by telling us about why 0.1%. Yeah, so... Uh... I, I basically I wrote the di- I wrote the diary during training from leaving my house to get into the end of training, um, and like captured a, a kind of like a year of kind of transformation and growth really, uh, but it was almost like during when I came to like publish the book eventually, which is kind of like a massive fast forward at this point. I needed a title that encapsulated a journey, so. Uh, I kind of flipped the the old formidable narrative, which kind of depicted back in the day st- statistically that one in you had a one in a thousand chance of becoming successful of becoming a Royal Marine commando. So I just uh, I just kind of flipped the stat really and came up with the uh, becoming the zero point one percent. But but when you say it like that, it's zero point one percent. It is the best of the best, isn't it? And when you see it as a number like that, I think it's even more powerful than ninety nine point nine percent people that need not apply. It's yeah, um, sure. one in a thousand get through. So um, I, I just really like the idea of that stat there. Listen, I want to talk lots about your time in the military. I want to talk lots about the book there because I really got a lot from it. It's a, it's a great book. But before that, um, I want to go back to an early Gareth because I understand you were high level in rugby league. Um, and I want to look, talk a little bit about what you did in your previous life in rugby league. And I suppose I want to really ask, the determination um, that you had to be high level in rugby league, was it in you to start with? Is it something that you had to work on? Can you tell us a little bit about the young Gareth? Yeah, sure, mate. It's, uh, I don't, it's, a, it's a great question, really. It, it kind of opens up that old uh, nature-nurture debate, really, in psychology yeah. as to wh- where does where does it kind of drive an innate talent and whatnot come from. I think I've always been... Uh, well, I mean... Early doors, my, my dad was a strength and conditioning coach at a, a, a first first like first division club in, in rugby league, like the Premier League. Okay. So from a really young age, from being like three or four years old, I was in dressing rooms. Mm-hmm. Uh, we with the players in like really elite environments and like kind of feeding and sponging off that kind of stuff. And I always used to look at like some of the cars that the players had and just how they were really maxing out their potential as an individual. And I always kind of really aspired and wanted to be a part of that and wanted to, to kind of do that myself. Uh, but I've always been uh, like incredibly driven mm-hmm. and uh, just really, really focused. And I've, I've got an element of, well, quite a large element of OCD, obsessive compulsive dif- disorder. So I think that's been a massive kind of fundamental factor in in, in helping me to remain consistent during really kind of adverse times, really. Well, I always think that we become a product of our environment. And, sure. and it is that nature nurtured. But if you're seeing successful people around you all the time from a young age, it, it can't help but rub off on you, I think. Absolutely, mate. And I, I, I'm, I am massive, massive on environment and, and seeking the right kind of environments to kind of 
to nurture the individual and get you to really, really like good and successful places. And in particular, like elite in, in elite environments, like being at the top at rugby league and then obviously going in the Royal Marines, they're just, they're just environments there where I think any amount of exposure will, will, will get you better. Uh, and that's what I've always kind of been about is getting, subjecting myself to these initially uncomfortable places but knowing that they will they will kind of they will shape me as a per, as an individual so what you learnt um on the field uh, rugby league I'm talking about now and the yeah. coaching and the training and the discipline did that really help you before you went into the military it did absolutely i didn't i didn't at the t- i didn't really acknowledge it at the time simon at all i uh, I, I, I played rugby from being seven years old and mm-hmm. at 15 I signed professionally 16 I was kind of like playing on telly and whatnot and mm-hmm. uh, things were just going like incredibly incredibly well and I uh, it, it came to a, a bit of an abrupt end did rugby just because they offered me they offered me a contract uh, over a long period of time and I, it, I just the money was just pretty much embarrassing and I, I wanted to sign for a shorter amount of time Mm-hmm. But they, uh, yeah, I mean. You were about 21 now, were you, from memory? Yeah, I were about, I, when I went in, I, were, I, I went in at 20 into the Marines. Okay. okay. Uh, and I passed out when I was 21. But I think there was so much adage and benefit from taking that path in rugby. And it's only through like recent reflection, really, that I've been able to mm-hmm. kind of understand just the magnitude of the the foundational basis that that gave me in, in terms of going in the Marines, like mm. being in a kind of an environment with other with other males and just going through that hardship and being in tough times. The the, the rugby definitely provided a really solid mm. foundation for that. I, I just asked the question there because uh, being in Australia and rugby league would be our game out in Australia. We 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 do love it. It's, it seems to be more union. Uh, in the UK. Uh, but again, if you look at the stats there, 0.1%, again, to get the high level in rugby league, it's a similar thing. It's got to be higher. It's got to be 0.01%, I, I would imagine. So it were really, they were incredibly tough. Yeah, yeah. I think back in uh, like na- between 90, 95 and, and, and year 2000, mm. I think that was like the golden era of rugby league, really. Yeah, uh, especially UK rugby league. There were like just such big names and charismatic names in the game, mm-hmm. uh, and it was incredibly hard to break through. Incredibly yeah. hard. Okay, so from rugby to the forces. So I understand your mum's to blame for you writing this book. Can you tell us a little bit about um, what she did and why you started writing the book? But but also, I, I want to ask uh, the motivation for keep on going. Uh, when yeah. can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, so uh, I I applied for the Marines. I'd undergone various elements of like failure along that journey on psychometric, psychometric testing and whatnot. Um, really dedicate myself for about about a good year and a half, really, to like physical and physical conditioning and mental preparation and stuff to go in there to give myself the very best chance. And then, obviously, the day came for me to travel down from a. A, a city up north called Wakefield, down to Limston, and down in the in the in the base of the UK. And uh, just before I got on the train, my mum, like just before the door shut, my mum gave me a diary that she just bought in a in a in a in a train station, um, like a W H Smith like or something like, like a that. W H Smith, something like that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And she gave me the diary, and just as the train doors were closing, she just said, just write in it, write anything. Uh, I want to see what you've what you what you're getting up to if you if you can if you can write it, but also I think it'll help you. And I can just remember it just being like, right, such a bizarre gift. Cause I was just like, I've never really subscribed to school because I had rugby and that were always going to be a major part, but I took it. And then on the way down, uh, it was just like such mixed emotions of like being scared to death, coupled with disbelief and uh, an element of shock, but then like real, real excitement in, in terms of what I was going down to do. So I just literally opened it a couple of hours in and just wrote down that I felt like we're on a roller coaster when you when you feel like you 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 almost get you plucked up the courage but you get strapped in and as it kind of you know you're on your way you want to get off but you can't and that's how it felt so I wrote that in and then I just 
wrote in it every day to the point where I had like maybe a week or two or three weeks content. And at that point, it's like, once you've got that, you want four. And once you've got a month, you may as well get another month. And before, lo and behold, I'd kind of kept it for a year then. And it captured me from being a, a weary kind of intimidated civilian. So mm. ended up being at the end of being a Royal Marine Commando. So it, it was just incredible, really. Yeah, I just asked about that because uh, another podcast that I love out there is The Diary of a CEO, uh, Stephen Bartlett. And um, I, I sent off for his diary and I, I thought it was a book actually, but it was actually a diary to fill out. And I thought, I, I, I don't know if I can be asked uh, to write that. Yeah. I, I, I like that. So I just want to know, did you start doing it out of fear that you're in trouble with your mother for not doing it? Uh, but But also, did it help you through the journey? I think it did help me, you know. And there must have been some form of of therapeutic benefit that I got mm. from it. Uh, it wasn't at all to keep it. I did actually like an element of taking it back and my family reading it. Mm -hmm. I liked an element of that, and that probably kept me right to some extent. But it's a strange one, and it's only something that I've learned with age, especially like with, with kind of book two coming out next year. But whenever I get into like adverse situations... I write, mm -hmm. uh, and that's when I kind of write, and, and I'm I'm the most creative when I'm like writing in adversity. So yeah. I don't know whether it were just like this unbelievable perfect storm of that coming together, mm -hmm. of me getting the diary in terms of the the apparatus, mm -hmm. and and me being able to just just this amazing like coincidental coming together. But uh, yeah, I mean. It, I suppose it did help. It definitely probably kept me in because I think one thing that I have explored in on, on previous podcasts is, is is that if you were to leave at like say week fifteen, week sixteen, you've got half a diary, hmm. and that's a terrible representation of failure, a physical hmm. representation re representation of failure. And I never acknowledged that, hmm. uh, but maybe subconsciously that that had an element to play. Yeah. Yeah, it could be. It's um. You, there's something else you said. Whenever you're in an adverse situation, you write. You write. I just want to explore that. Does that help your to get your thoughts in your mind down on paper to visually look at it? Does it does it stop things going around in your head? Um, I I know if I've got a problem in my head, uh, if I write it down before I go to bed, I get a good night's sleep. If I don't, yeah. I just know it goes around and around and around my head all night long, and I'll wake up thinking about it. Yeah. Do you think that helps when you write things down when you have uh, a problem or an adverse situation, as you said? Yeah, I mean, I don't write problems down. Mm -hmm. I write, uh, I don't know, I just seem to be quite articulate mm -hmm. in, in, in kind of those moments. And I don't know if it's because I'm struggling with the perception of the external and the external pressures and the stress and the whatever else and the potential elements of cognitive exhaustion mm -hmm. but uh but it does help it just seems to focus my mind i think there's a massive ele element of distraction there which is almost always a real fundamental kind of counter measure to to mitigate burnout mm. so maybe it's kind of it, this just this all-encompassing therapeutic kind of uh self-medicating kind of mm. Yeah, prescription that I kind of that that I, that I fall into. Yeah, okay. And um, most of us have not been through anything like the training you've gone through. Can you share any specific moments through the Royal Marines Commando training that particularly were challenging, push you to your limits? And yeah. I suppose what we really want to know is, and if it did, how did you overcome it? I think the the there's a massive misconception with training, uh, and 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 what I mean by that is is that people go in there. And they're, they're prepared, they're conditioned, they've gone through selection, they've gone through various other elements to get in there. But you you think that you you fall in love with this this mystique of it. Uh, and it's almost like you think that when you get in there, you're going to be fast roping out of helicopters, you're going to be wearing night vision goggles, you're going to be doing all the like the, what, what we, we call see. the, Gu the yeah. Gucci stuff. We call it the Gucci stuff. Gucci uh, stuff, okay. The Gucci <laughs> stuff, yeah. yeah, but, yeah. That, but, but you absolutely don't. Uh, mm. The first... 15 weeks are just completely designed to weed out those that don't possess the aptitude to, to continue on. And as a result, how they do that is the main fabric of that is, is sleep deprivation. So you put under massive strain of sleep deprivation, 
uh, self discipline is absolutely fundamental in in in, in those moments and mm-hmm. uh, subscribing to teamwork and, the, and 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 knowing that although it is your own personal endeavor, you are you 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 completely need the help of others. And by personal, I mean that you, you're in your own head. You you you're the own you you're the own captain of your own ship, kind of thing. But uh, I mean, between like week eight and week ten, which is in the diary, we had ten hours sleep in two weeks. They kept Gosh. us up for say that again. Ten, 10, hours, 10, 10, hours. ten hours. Ten hours sleep in two weeks. Yeah, they kept us awake wow. for four days, and then we had like an hour sleep, uh, awake for another two days, and it got to the point where. Lads were literally falling asleep, stood up. Yeah. Uh, and you'd like catch your friend before he like hit the floor and then you, it had happened to you. And it mm. was just absolute carnage. And it's, it's, I think what sleep deprivation does is it sabotages your motivation. Mm. So what underlies that once that your motivation is gone is, is how kind of rigid and how successful you, your own personal routines are. And if your routines are really, really good, your, your strategic routines that are geared towards success, i.e. straight after your day's finished, you wash your clothes, you iron them, you do your bed, you do your admin, that's your success elements in order to set up the next day for success. If you go straight to bed at the end because you've got no discipline and think that you can get up in the middle of the night and do it all then when everybody's sleeping, you can't. Mm. Uh, it's just not designed that way. So... Uh, I imagine ten hours sleep in two weeks. You 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 can't be thinking straight. If have I got that right? So you have to rely on just your your habits, your routines that are already in place. Would, would yeah, that be correct? It. Yeah, you're you're in like you're in like a state of autopilot, but you absolutely do become conditioned to a lack of sleep. Okay, you do, and it, you know what? It's all about it's all about acceptance. Mm. It's all about like. If you think you're not going to get any sleep and you're falling out with yourself about it, like, for instance, if you know that you've got an important day the following day and you can't sleep as a result and you, you every time that you're thinking that you need to go to sleep, you're adding more and more pressure and then you have adrenaline and then that you can't sleep. If you just accept it that you and whatnot and just think, you know what, I'm if, even if I don't sleep, I'm still going to just, mm. I'll get up, I'll, I'll get out of bed and I'll mm. still go and do me day as soon as you arrive at that place where you just like it just becomes part of the, the challenge it just becomes part of it mm. uh, of what you need to do you 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 arrive in a much better place so and that's what it was just kind of all about really arriving at acceptance quickly you kind of shot me i i understand the military has to weed people out who who has got what it takes there so again, being naive here, I thought it would be running up the hill with a backpack on and doing all that. But, but it's the sleep deprivation is something that I'd never expected you to say was one of the, the worst things. But um, yeah, but- I mean, I mean the the physical element to it is, it is it's horrendous. It's incredibly mm. tough, especially when you've had no sleep. Mm. You're carrying kit. I mean, they gradually build you up in, incrementally in terms of how you handle the kit and stuff and. Yeah, uh, I mean, towards the end, you're doing like a, a, a 26 mile extraction yomp over Dartmoor, carrying mm. that hundred pound a kit, mm. and you've had no sleep for two or three days the night before that. Yeah. But uh, the thing is, with it, what you really, really come to terms with, with a with a physical element of it, which is massive, is that all you have to do is move. You just break it. You don't look at what you've got in front of you. you just move your body in the moment. Mm-hmm. So it's just. If you have to run, just all you've got to do with simplistic terms is put one leg in front of the other. And if you simply if you simplify that process, just keep doing that and you'll get to wherever you need to get to. Listen, there's there's something else in the book. I'd love you to tell us a story about in the gym and sweating in the gym. And uh, yeah. I, again, I, I, I hope I don't offend you when I say this, but I read this. And I thought, what? They don't even let you sweat in the gym. What's that all about there? But until you hear... Uh, the punchline and the reason it, it just stopped me in my tracks. Can, can you share that story with us? Yeah. So you go into like the, the Royal Marines gymnasium, which is like a big uh, massive, like school gymnasium with like apparatus on the sides and whatnot. And you're doing all this kind of functional movements, which is called, uh, it's called IMF. It's like a Swedish kind of concept where they, you, 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 you have to move your body with, with precision, uh, 
to various positions on command. Uh, and then you do rope climbs, you do various other like camp circuits where you're running 400 metre circuits and you have to be under a lot of time. And obviously what happens is you start transpiring uh, throughout mm-hmm. that, that period. And the natural reaction is, and you probably get this when you when you hear it, is that you you just have a natural reaction to touch your face. It's a natural instinct to touch your mm-hmm. face, to wipe water away from your eyes so you don't become compromised or whatnot, or it tickles and you want to itch that because it's tickling. But you just, once they say stop, or once you're commanded not to move, you cannot flinch or move. You've got to be perfectly still, like mm-hmm. perfectly still. And any kind of movement or fidgeting or whatever, there's various people always around you that are correcting your body position, making sure that you're, you're in perfect alignment and whatnot. And if you touch your face or whatever, you're punished. And I were always just thinking like, why is it kind of this so anal? Why is it mm. like so, why is so it? So you touch your face at all, it's just get your hands away from your face, don't touch your face. Yeah, you'll get down. You'll be doing like twenty burpees as a punishment, yeah. okay. or you'll be you'll be there'll be physical repercussion for you mm-hmm. fidgeting or touching your face. Uh, basically, showing emotion in in a, in a lot of in a lot of ways. Uh, and it and, and this happens. This this like really nth degree of like human engineering is happening all the time, and it's like a breaking down of larger behavioral kind of physical output manifestations. To the to the to the real minute where where it kind of where it where where it, where the inception comes from, and it wasn't till after really that I that, that I, I kind of learned that like when we're in like OPs on operations like op- op- observation posts, I mean we did one when I passed when I finished training we're like up in the Isle of Skye, and we were there for like four or five days, and you literally you you can't move, uh, and if and if in in like live operations, if you imagine if you're in the jungle or whatever, and you've got a spider crawling over your face, or you there's something that that is causing you to to move your body or or make a movement, it can give you position away to the enemy, and it can compromise where you are, and as a result, yeah, you could get killed, or it could destroy the mission, or you could all get killed. So hmm. it's that the teachings in the gym, preparing you every single time, no matter what. For, for for life outside of training and, and in that respect it's it's so that you are able to self-regulate I love you're it. able it, to manage your emotions it makes so much sense now that you explain it yeah it's something i want to ask did they give you the reason before the training or is that just completely after yeah they don't tell you anything before yeah. No. So you're in the middle it's, of it thinking, why are they not letting me touch my face? This is ridiculous. So is that thought process going through your mind at the time? Well, it is. I mean, you undergo like this really like sharp and upward curve of like mm. this new kind of life and cultural expectation. And you very, very quickly uh, stumble across what's expected. Mm. Uh, and you don't really question it. You just know that that's what you need to be doing. Yeah. In in this in this instance, and it's it's everything. But but you know, at some point, there is a reason for everything. Um, they're not there's just re- doing. Yeah, yeah. There's a reason for everything. It's like, uh, yeah, just just uh, there's the the, the face. There's mm. not to, been able to touch your face. There's just everything is kind of broken down. Every part of human behavior is broken down, and and the and the the retrain it. I, I hear this about this breakdown and then you retrain it and rebuilding the the uh, the building blocks, the steps. Um, did you feel at some point there's a significant um, uh, mindset j- changes, an attitude changes halfway through, or is it just a gradual thing that you get to the end of it and realise what's happened? Yeah, so I, uh, I can remember like having quite an awakening in terms of, a change in, in how I kind of looked at it, the process. And it were about week 15, week 16, where I, I just thought the the training team would, would keep coming in. They're called cultural assassins. I've, I've wrote about it in book two. It's, a, it's about how you factor and, and, and build cultural DNA mm-hmm. in, to, to create successful environments. And you have cultural architects that 
basically they're in charge of upholding this particular culture that you want within your organization or your, your thing. And you have cultural assassins who are sometimes prescribed or sometimes they're naturally occurring. And they kind of act to destroy the culture hmm. so that you've got to keep rebuilding it. And the training team basically were all, to some degree, cultural assassins. Mm -hmm. And uh, they would just come in and say, like, right, get all your stuff and just throw it out at window at one o'clock in the morning. Or uh, just do other things that were just, like, just destroyed your morale, basically. And I got to a place at week 15 where I thought, I'm not going anywhere. I'm here till the end. So whatever they say, I'm just going to do it straight away because I've got nothing else to do. And I'm just going to accept it. Just uh, accept it and move on. Just accept it instantly. There's no point in me kind of like going against it and like muttering to the others and, and being yeah. in this internal conflict inside. Because mm. very similar to like, if you imagine like in sport, and we've do, I've done some stuff with, with England Rugby League women, where the girls were really, really bad at answering back to the referee. Mm. And I said to him like, when have you ever gone to a referee and said, you know what, I don't believe in that, sir. And he's gone, you know what, you're right, and changed his decision. It never yes. happens. So true. Yeah, you've just got to get on with it. Mm. So there's no point going and wasting your energy. You're distracted in that moment. You're living in the past reality. You need to get back into where we are now, which is we're in a defensive position. Yeah. Uh, so that's what I just arrived at. I just thought, I'm just going to accept it. And as a result, when they did something, I, I, I were able to bypass the anguish and the denial of it mm. and the anger and just throw my stuff out the window first, get it all first, yeah. wash it, iron it, and get ready before anybody else did. And I'm not saying that I were only the, the only person that arrived at that kind of yeah. this, 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 this methodology. Mm. But there were others that really, really didn't arrive there. And as a result, a lot of them didn't complete Make the training. But yeah, but some of them did, but they had a worse time than me. Mm. Yeah. And that, 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 that was key. You must have seen people around you. It's human nature. Someone's throwing all your stuff out the window saying, what the fuck's that all about? What are you doing? It must yeah. be that, that, is it a victim mentality that we naturally have as humans? I don't know if that's the right way to describe that, but it must be so difficult to overcome that natural human reaction. Yeah, yeah. I mean, one of the things that the ones did was they came, we lived in blocks. Uh, there were like five-story high blocks. And on each kind of level, you had a troop. And down the middle was like the the stairway, but the shaft down the middle, if you look over each balcony, you can see the bottom, if you know what I mean. And we were on the top. And they came in one night at about two o'clock and said, right, everybody, get all your stuff and throw it down the middle. Uh, so we threw everything down the middle. And there were like this massive mountain pile mm -hmm. of clothing. But there's like... It were well, it were ten foot high. This, 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 oh, this, this mountain of clothing. But everybody's got the same stuff, the same coloured stuff. Yeah. So we we had to literally wade through that, and the only way that you knew what it was is because uh, you had to read the name out in the back of the t-shirt, and they did it because they wanted how to know. many how many people would have been there? So how big is this pile? Yeah. So there were like between probably 30 and 40 people's clothing yeah. there yeah. that all look the same. Yeah. And they did it because they wanted to see who hadn't put the name in the clothing. Wow. Yeah. So Is it was that... just a massive, it were a massive lesson in, in uh, attention to detail. It, it's that same thing again, Gareth. It's the reason why after though, it, yeah. it, it comes through all the time there. And it's, um, yeah. I'm yeah. just I, I'm just thinking about sales managers in a car dealership because this this podcast there's lots of people in the motor trade obviously listen to it, and it's we say do straight lines sell cars, um, and you get people start up and say what is that all about straight line sell cars, you know what I'm gonna say they do, because when someone turns up the place just feels right there's retail in the detail. Uh, I was yeah. with um, Johnny Carnell yesterday, and we we're talking about that exact thing that. 
It's such a minor thing. And you get brand new people turn up and say, really, does it have to be a straight line on the cars displayed there? But something a customer doesn't even notice. And it's there is a reason why. Um, yeah. We, we have a great client, um, the Smive organizations, Mr. Smive. He hates the idea of coats on the back of the chairs in his car dealerships. And you get brand new people turn up and say, what's that all about? But when you listen to the reason, it's all about yeah. the standards. That's um, it, yeah. And, yeah. and it, it's so many similar things are coming out there. Um, yeah. I, I love the idea of that. Uh, listen, something else I want to talk to you about now is this. Um, you talk about a life sacrifice ratio. So you've got a training course, which is uh, 32 weeks. Uh, I know you're there for 34 weeks there. And you talk lots about that. Hold on. This is for 34 weeks of my life. If I can get through this, it's going to set me up for the rest of my life. Um, I, I'd love you to share a bit about your thoughts about the life sacrifice ratio in other industries. But but then also, do you have any advice for the, the line manager in the uh, in the motor trade that says, well, that might be great for you, Gareth, but what do I do when next month it starts again? Next month it starts again. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the uh, the life sacrifice ratio? Yeah, so I... Uh... This were all to do with like my mental preparation. Uh, at the very, very start of training, I just like kind of thought it's going to be horrendous, and I don't want to kind of sugarcoat it and 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 try and say anything other because ultimately I'm setting myself up for failure if I do that. Hmm. So I just I just thought I'd kind of got to this place where I thought it's only ten months in my life. Do you know what I mean? It's a, a year in my life. Just call it a year. Yeah, but it's it's. It's a year where I'll lose all my autonomy. I'll lose all my freedom. Uh, I'll go through hell. But it's only one year. And it's it's one year of sacrifice that I've got to give in order to live the rest of my life with that title mm. and benefit from everything that will come after that, the opportunities, uh, the earning potential and everything else. So I just in the book, I just called it the sacrifice to life ratio. And I just felt that it was just really important to when we have got like big or small goals that are quite overwhelming uh, and we don't know whether we should invest. It's it, from a personal development perspective. You've just got to look at like the sacrifice to life ratio and just think, you know what, it's 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 worth the sacrifice. I thought if I if I as a human being, as a young lad, can't sacrifice a year in my life to reap the rewards of of that for years to come, mm. for me that's that's not a difficult trade off. Mm. I just didn't see it as a difficult trade off. But what it did was when I went into training, it just absolutely prepared me mentally mm. because I'd got down there and I knew it was going to be shit. Yeah. So I were already in a good mental place for it, and and as a result, I I kind of um, were able to like gain and, and maintain momentum. Uh, how much? Did you know before you went in? Had you spoke to other people about how shit it was going to be? Uh, it, was it just watching things like uh, Who Dares Wins on TV? I don't know if that would have been out back then. Yeah. Um, um, uh, what did you know beforehand? Yeah, so my, my dad my dad and my mum were in the Navy. Uh, okay. But I'd never, uh, they'd never really, they just, I was just brought up knowing that it was incredibly, incredibly tough. Uh, yeah. at rite of passage. I just, I just kind of, I, I kind of, just knew that. Um, and then I looked at the training. There were a couple of documentaries that were really old school documentaries that were around mm -hmm. in the 90s. One were on a, on a mountain leaders course, which is the hardest course in the world, mm -hmm. uh, Royal Marines mountain leaders course. And uh, I just loved it. It just like really appealing. I loved the the fact that these guys were like, they'd done it. And I just really wanted to be like, in a, in a sense, a, a part of that club really. Um uh, but I, there were a local guy uh, that had, that had done it, and I were talking to him. And it's it, no matter if you talk to anybody that's done it, they'll always say it's the hardest thing in the world because the want to. Do you know what I mean? The want mm -hmm. to, and it, and it is, it is it, rightfully so. It is, but it's not impossible. Do you know what I mean? It's not impossible with the right application and and strategy. You can kind of get through it. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, in terms of. Uh, the line manager and stuff like that, what advice I'd give him is is just is compartmentalization really in, in looking at the I suppose I don't know if this is applicable, but the short the short lead times and just 
you break them you break them down and then you you just add in as much attention to detail as possible for me attention to detail it, it is is everything it's mm-hmm. the mundane that we all we always look over and we struggle with the mundane it being being human beings we struggle with the mundane because we don't think the small things matter mm-hmm. but the small things are the ripple effect the, the small things are where the elite edges yeah that's where the that's where the the true brilliance is in the small things but people just overlook it they don't think it matters yeah it is the the little things they all add up marginal gains um that's it if you look at at sky um cycling team um it's massive in sport mate it's it is sport it's in sport they're called the one percenters Mm. and it's like what that's how like elite teams get the edge over elite teams is how well you can subscribe with self-discipline to the one percent behaviors uh, and ultimately, w- one's uh, investment in that, or the collective team's investment in that, will determine success at that elite level. Mm-hmm. But it's when we use it in the Marines, it's like when we're going out on operations against the Taliban and whatnot. We're just better at the one percenters. Mm-hmm. We're just more disciplined at it. Mm-hmm. Interesting. They get get the basics right. Um... The basics, yeah. The ba- it's like the foundations right you, you can't you can't build anything on, on faulty foundations and that's just that's just how we how we work um that just leaves me to say that all details of this episode and other episodes on the selling in the motor trade can be found on our website simcotraining.co.uk go there to get a copy of our book words that sell cars go there to sign up to a free trial of our sales fitness online sales training program Easiest way to get hold of me is Simon Bokert through LinkedIn. Thank you.